לממשלה ומשרדים וההשקעות הכספיות Tap, tap, tap by E.S. Wynn. Tap, tap, tap. I see him in my mind, his golden ring flashing, flashing over and over again as he taps his thin, talon-like finger against the ebony cover of a book that has no name. Tap, 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 again and again, endless. I see his robe, the thick indigo veins, spiderwebbing through his pallid flesh like lightning, the bony edges of his knuckles, always rising, always falling, tapping the cover in a ceaseless staccato of sharp sounds. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. In my dreams I see that tapping finger. I see it when I stare past glass on the bus ride to work. I see it when I close my eyes, when I open them. Hear that tapping in everything I do. Feel it everywhere I go. Tap, tap, tap. The ring flashes across the cover of the book. Flashes as it taps. And in the reflection, I can almost see his face. See who he is. The man ceaselessly tapping. Tapping in my mind. Tapping in my dreams. Tapping through every waking moment. Tapping. Tap, tap, tapping. Tap, tap, tap. That face! If only I could see that face! The ring is clear, the finger pale and crooked. An old man's finger, the nail long and yellowing, chipped at the tip where it taps. But the face! Why can't I see his face? Strings of pale hair, long and greasy, hang over his forehead, shade his eyes, distort the lines of his nose, his face. But if I could just... if I could only... tap, tap, tap. I'm on the bus when it happens. I'm on the bus when the tap, tap, tap finally gets to me and I snap. Can anyone else hear that tapping? I shout. But it's clear from the looks, the wary eyes, the throats, swallowing past fearful knots that no one else can. I'm alone, the only person haunted by the rise and fall of the ring, of the finger tapping, tapping on, always tapping. Tap, tap. Tap. I can't stand it. I don't care if it's only in my head. I stand up, eyes darting left to right, eyes darting, looking. The bus driver yells at me to sit, but I can't hear him over the tapping, over the sound of that nail hitting ebony, over and over again. Gestures, shouting cut through the air, and then there are men standing, watching me, saying words that never reach my ears. All I can hear is the tapping, the tapping. When the first hand touches me, I scream. In another moment, it's over. I'm pinned to the floor by the meaty arms of men far stronger than I am, held there until the bus pulls to an empty stop, and I'm handed off to a waiting cop. The handcuffs go on hard, hurt, pinch skin, but I don't care. All I care about is the tapping, the tapping. Tap, tap, tap. The back seat of the patrol car cold and scratchy. My eyes sway drunkenly across icy glass, across the officer's face, the moving lips that do nothing but mumble through the tapping. The officer gives me a meaningful look, waits, shakes his head, and then the car is moving, taking me away, taking me to a place where maybe, maybe, I can escape the tapping. But when we arrive, when I'm booked, led down a long, vomit-colored hallway and locked away behind iron bars. I know the tapping will never stop. 
I scream, howl, throw myself at the bars over and over again, but it is only my body that yields in the end. My body and my sanity. I turn and he's there, there, sharing the cell with me, and for the first time I can see his face, see the hollow eyes, the hooked nose, the crooked teeth of the man who tortures me. I run at him, swing my fists at him, but every blow passes through him as if he were made of mist. Broken, desperate, I scream, but the man only smiles, grins wide, his teeth sharp, eyes staring, violently yellow. And the finger with the ring rises and falls, rises and falls, tap, tap, taps on the ebony cover of the book that has no name, endless, eternal. Tap, tap. Mrs. Sowers. Oh, hello, Mrs. Peters. Busy day ahead of you. Can't be. Market's closed. Oh, I know. I know. All the shops are closed. Plague, don't you know? Plague? Pui. Plague. It's a conspiracy, it is. Oh, I know. I know. They call it the Black Plague, but it's all for nonsense. Oh, I know. It's the government, you know. The king? Oh, not just the king. The queen, too. I don't know, of course. I mean, the cardinal and the bishops and the old poop. Which old poop is that? You know, the flashy fellow with the big hat. Oh, the poop poop. Are you saying the church is involved? Oh, yes, yes. They want a one-flat-earth government, you see. Oh, I know, I know. It's how they'll take away our rights and privileges. What rights and privileges? You know, our right to work 20 hours a day, our right to defecate in the streets. Doesn't the entire Vatican operate because of taxes and tithes? No, the priests have a small white collar. They don't wear ties. Not ties! Tithes! Ew, say it, don't spray it. Doesn't the archdiocese need donations to operate the churches? And? And the king and all the duke and barons need taxes to run the kingdom. And? So why would they do it? Do what? It makes no sense that the king, the queen, the cardinals... And the old poop. And the pope would make a fake pandemic to destroy the economy because they're only hurting themselves. Oh? They get rich from making sure us peasants are gainfully employed, don't you know? Bah! What? Bah! Go ahead, be a sheep. Follow all the little multitudes to the pins where they size you up for slaughter. No, not me, not by gum. No need to get salty. Well then, what do you think this is happening? I suppose you think it's God's wrath. God? Yes. No, 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 no. Well, maybe. Right, well, at least we sorted that out. I don't think the church can do anything to help. Are you saying asking the church for forgiveness isn't a cure? No. And joining the flagellants to punish yourself for your sins isn't a cure either? No. Well, look at you. Are you just the medicinal leech? What do you think is the cause and cure of this plague, then? I think it's nits. Nits? Nits! Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've heard. Creatures that can barely be seen, who barely even nip at you, are responsible for what they call the Black Death across the countryside. Huh? You're a loony. Am not. Am too. Am not. Am too. Well... Didn't your Roger die of the plague? Of course not. Where did you hear that? False tidings. I heard he had a fever and the chills. Well, he did have the fever and the chills. Well, he's better now. And the abdominal pain and weeping blood. All better now. Really? Of course. Well, why hasn't he been to the mill all week? Well, of course he hasn't been at the mill. He's resting. Resting? Yes, resting. He told me last week that he was feeling a little under the weather and wanted a bit of a lie down. Last week? Last week-ish. 
I looked in on him a couple of days ago, and he's lost his blackish complexion, and he's got a lovely greenish colour now. Green? Did you talk to him? No, no. You know what men are like when they're in a mood. Best wait for him to talk to me. How do you know he doesn't have the plague? Alleged. Alleged black plague. Well, he's not in the risk group now, is he? He don't eat olive oil or get too much exercise. He never bathes and city life don't distress him none. He don't? No, he just dreams of country living, my Roger, he does. That's it? We keep fresh-cut flowers in the house to keep out unpleasant smells that would make a plague. My son did plague in his trousers the other day. I did think I smelled something from his room a couple of days ago. But quick as down on a duck, I brought in more flowers. And now our hovel smells like a lovely indoor garden. We're perfectly safe. Well, if you ask me, the only way to avoid the plague is to hide from it. Hide from the plague? Oh, yes. It's a sneaky devil. It tracks you down and gets you. How do you hide from a plague? You disguise yourself. How? Wear a mask. A mask? It confuses the plague. And you came up with this? Not O. The CDC. The CDC? The church demands compliance group. Well, I'm in then. But I know who I want my mask to look like. And that will be... The old poop. It wouldn't dare infect me then. Now I know why they are all about a black plague. Why? Bellman's Union. Bellman's Union? Yes. If there wasn't bad news, what would they go on about? Bellman's Union? You might have a point there. <coughs> oh, sounds like the sniffles. Well, remember, my Roger had a bad cough. You are <coughs> looking a little black around the gills. <coughs> It'll be green soon, dearie. Yes, yes. And it's easy being green. <coughs> Goya's Masterpiece by Mark Slade Valeria laid naked on an enormous wooden bed propped up on several silk pillows. With the sunlight streaming across her jutting breasts, honey-brown ringlets dazzled those pale, soft shoulders, a hand resting on her chin and a devious smile across her plum lips. No one would know that murder was the sparkle in those hazel eyes. Goya sat in his chair with an obsessive eye on his lover and model, listening to the French troops take siege of Madrid. Goya had been a favorite artist of the Spanish powers that be, but not now that the government was in such disarray and inevitably under Emperor Napoleon's control. None of that mattered to Goya. Politics was of little interest to him. He cared not who ruled the country, as long as they continued to commission him to paint and make engravings. Next to the bed was a wide canvas, ready for the painting to be created. To the left of that were four candles burning brightly. A piece of paper was under his paint-stained bare feet, with words written in human blood and anointed by a devil's breath, which Goya had bought from an old woman he'd met in the tavern a few days before. From his keen eye, a sketch of Valeria began to form on the canvas. In mere moments, a finished charcoal drawing of her hypnotic pose on the bed was in full view. Valeria laughed and yawned. How much longer do I need to do this? She stretched her legs and arms, her breasts bobbed up and down, nipples like sewing needles. Not long, my darling, Goya grunted, trying to keep his concentration from straying away from her and the bed. If that happened, the drawing would include anything else he concentrated on. The background was being added, a dash of brown and red, light gray on black. In quick strokes, Valeria was added, pale white skin upon dense red pillows, pink highlights on her curves, sunlight accentuating her most attractive features, but did not exclude her open legs and wild curly pubic region. There was one area of the canvas left unattended. No charcoal sketch or paint had been applied yet. 
You can take rest now. Goya rubbed his tired eyes. Finally, Valeria exclaimed. She rolled over on her stomach, buried her face in the pillows before turning on her back again. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Valeria crooned, rose up, sat on the side of the bed, and kicked her legs playfully. You still have feelings for him. Goya was annoyed by her question. He was fiercely jealous of Valeria's other lover, General Diego Montoya. He was an ugly little man with the nose of a pig and the intelligence of an ass. He marshaled Madrid for many years, often imprisoning people who were innocent and made sure he took silver from the guilty. I do. Of course. He was very kind to my family. Before the war began, Valeria smiled, thought of her loved ones that were no longer alive. Actually, plotting a murder might not be good for your soul. I'm not in the least bit interested in my soul. I need this vengeance to ease my mind. Goya hated General Montoya for many reasons, none of which were political, all of which had to do with stealing everything the artist had worked so hard for. Money, women, and his reputation. He begged the kingdom's high courts to strip Goya as chief artist to the king. The last straw came when rumor became fact. For seven of Valeria's twenty-five years, General Montoya was her lover as well as Goya, a secret the two of them kept from almost everyone but Montoya's brother Luis, who betrayed General Montoya in hopes that Napoleon's advisers would reward him as mayor of Madrid. There came a knock at the door. Goya and Valeria exchanged glances. That would be Diego, Valeria said, lying on the bed, finding her original pose. There was another knock, an impatient rapping. Goya? Montoya's muffled voice was heard. Goya, open up, he demanded in his military characteristic. Then his demeanor changed dramatically. A softer, heartbroken plea came through. Let me in. Is Valeria in there? Goya slowly rose from his chair. He shuffled toward the door and turned the doorknob. Montoya didn't let him open the door completely. He pushed his way in and rushed past Goya. Montoya fell to his knees. Overwhelmed by grief, he began sobbing and dragged himself across the floor to the bed. Valeria, he cried in a sing-song voice. The last time he saw her was when she was in her bed, sick, knocking on death's door. Valeria, my darling, my life has been shit since you left me. Come, lay with me, my love. Valeria offered her arms to Montoya. You have kept her from me, Goya, Montoya sobbed. Valeria tried to quell his sobbing by humming to him. She ran her fingers through his wiry, greasy hair. You could have done the same as me, but you are too much of a coward, Goya said, sitting back down in that rickety wooden chair. I value my soul in the afterlife. I would never consort with a witch, Goya. Of course, I can never be as cavalier about those things as you. But again... Montoya turned to Goya. You are nothing but filth painting those horrible, sad pictures of death, spreading a lie about how a true artist lives, when in reality you are more miserable than any peasant. Goya let a sick, sadistic smile cross his blotchy face. Listen, General Montoya. He kept an ear to hear the commotion outside the building. People screaming, gunshots fired, men screaming, marching, shouting in French. Goya laughed. They're coming for your family, General. Soon they will be sharing a prison cell with the other Spanish government scum, and when they are tired of torturing your wife and piglet children, they will throw them in a pit and burn them alive. Montoya screamed, his face stricken with rage, his arms flailing about, his legs already squirming off the bed. He tried to pull away from Valeria's grasp, but she still had a handful of his hair. The knife materialized in her other hand, sliced through Montoya's jugular. Blood ran rapid like flowing waters from a warm spring on a mountainside, dripping down his dust-covered uniform. Montoya gurgled, threw his hands over his wound. He spun around, slipped from the bed, sat on the floor, facing Goya. Goya's trained eye watched the whole scene. The painting was now finished. The blotch of white had been filled in quickly with Montoya staring into oblivion with dead eyes, hands on his bloody neck, and Valeria lying on the bed, her naked body blood-stained and the knife in her hand, ready to strike again. Slowly, 
General Montoya's body vanished. Vengeance had been served. There was another knock on the door. Goya reluctantly rose from his chair. He opened the door, and Luis Montoya walked in. He was even fatter than his brother, the general, but not as tall. He smelled like he'd been drinking for days, and his thick beard was dripping with sweat. He waddled to the painting, stared at it. He blinked a few times. It's done, then, Luis grinned. I will hang this in my office when Emperor Napoleon makes me mayor. He grabbed the painting, placed it under his arms. Luis went to the open door, stepped outside, then turned to Goya. Oh, yes. He took a bundle of coins wrapped in a piece of dirty cloth and dropped it at Goya's feet. I almost forgot your commission. He laughed as he shuffled down the hall. Goya shut the door. He picked up his money, sighed. A gentle breeze blew, and the flames on the candles were vanquished, as so too was Valeria. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, oh, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. <sighs> Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy... Horror, satire, and lots of action. Wow! That sounds great, Dad! Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. <laughs> there is, Daddy-O! Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Roxbrocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour. And now there's... Yeah? Twisted Pulp Magazine! <laughs> What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness! Available on all your digital devices! That is what it is! Look! Whoa! Dad, this looks awesome! Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome! You definitely have that right, my good man! Ha <laughs> ha! Thanks, Dr. Mary! My pleasure, Billy! And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye! Dad? Uh, uh, just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine! Available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere! Or at Amazon.com or ArchaicMedia.info That is A-R-C-H-A-I-C-M-E-D-I-A dot info! <laughs> Headlights by Mark Slade Sean rose from his bed, feeling the dampness of sweat on his arms. He rubbed the middle of his forehead with two fingers and yawned. Outside his bedroom window, the sun was setting. In another three hours, he would make his way down Highway 20 to the warehouse and work another 12-hour shift, boxing up assorted chocolates and placing them on a pallet. Cora was in the other room, playing on the computer. He could see the light from the monitor flicker in the dark room across the hallway. He threw on a pair of jeans and a sweater, clumsily staggered to the other bedroom. He saw Cora staring intently at the screen, her large framed glasses sitting at the end of her nose. He waited by the doorway, decided not to disturb her. She had just got off work at the dry cleaners an hour before. He was sure she needed some time to unwind. Sean went into the kitchen, looked in the refrigerator, and grabbed a handful of ham and chucked a roll into his mouth. He reached for the gallon of milk, when some headlights coming down the lane caught his attention. It was blindingly bright, passing through the kitchen window. Sean squinted, raised his arm to block the light from his eyes. He went to the back door, opened it slightly, peeked out. No one was there. The headlights were gone. No car out in his driveway. He and Cora lived a good two miles from the next neighbor, so it was a big deal when someone drove up to his house. In the past year, only Cora's dad had visited, and maybe Jones from work. Since all ties were broken with Sean's family, and it would take more than an episode of Oprah to sort it all out, chances of a visitor out of the blue was rare. Sean shrugged and closed the door. Strange, he said to himself. Maybe I'm still dreaming. He poured himself a glass of milk, took a long sip. 
Then he placed the glass on the table and went to the room where Cora was still watching YouTube on the computer. Sean leaned against the doorway. Hey, he said, his voice booming. It took a second before Cora realized he had said something. She removed the headphones from her tangled brown hair, smiled. You said something? Sean nodded. How was your day? Okay, didn't know you were up. Cora swirled around in her swivel chair. Been up a few minutes. Did you see the headlights coming down the lane? Sean rubbed the sleep out of his eyes. No, who's here? Cora folded her arms, stretched her neck to see out the window. That's the weird thing. Nobody is here. I saw the headlights almost blinded me. I poked my head out the back door, no car there. Sean shrugged, laughed. I bet you were dreaming or something. Cora stood. She walked up to Sean and kissed him. That's what I thought too, but I don't know. Cora patted him on the stomach. I'll go make you some eggs, how's that? Yeah, okay, Sean said. He stepped aside and let her past him. He followed her to the kitchen. Sean rose from his bed, feeling the dampness of sweat on his arms. He rubbed the middle of his forehead with two fingers and yawned. Outside his bedroom window, the sun was setting. He saw the headlights coming down the lane. He slid on a pair of jeans and a shirt. He ran through the hall and into the kitchen. He opened the back door and stepped out on the cold ground. Cora put the metro in park and turned off the engine. She quickly got out of the car, left the driver's door wide open. She was sobbing, trying to talk on her cell phone. She stumbled through the yard and walked through Sean and into the house. Sean heard her say, Dad, Sean, Sean was killed this morning, another car. Sean followed her in and became a memory. This is Jackie Ayers, and you've been listening to Dead Airwaves on KKRN. Episode 3, Tap, 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 by E.S. Wynn. Read by E.S. Wynn. Plague Studies, starring Jack Ward and John Bell. Written by Jack J. Ward and John Bell. Goya's Masterpiece, by Mark Slade. Read by Nancy Bueller. Headlights by Mark Slade. Read by Corey Graham. Theme music by Tim Slade.